hey, happy Wednesday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Daily Dope is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Yes, I'm Jeff McAleer, your host here at The Daily Dope, presented by TheGamingGang.com, of which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. So, yes, welcome aboard. It's a War Game Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Tonight is episode 290 of The Daily Dope. It is Wednesday, April 24th, 2019. Tonight, I am actually going to unbox and take the first look at Empire of the Sun, the Pacific War, 1941 to 1945, designed by Mark Herman. This is from GMT Games. This is, I believe, the third printing that we are going to be taking a look at. So, going to bust that out, going to uh, kind of take a deep dive inside of all the components, and so on and so forth. So... Well, 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 yes, it's War Game Wednesday. <laughs> so, do want to point out this is a live stream. So, if you are watching live on YouTube, there is chat available. It is not on screen. It's one of the ways that I keep some of these stranger commenters at bay. But I do pay attention to the chat. So, if you want to say howdy, or maybe you have a question, or there's something about Empire of the Sun you want to get a closer look at. Or maybe uh, have me spend a moment uh, kind of diving into, by all means, chime in and I will respond. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you check out some of the videos on the Gaming Gang channel and you dig them, by all means, please subscribe. If you do subscribe, don't forget to ring that bell because that will not only notify you when there's a new video, but it'll also tell you within about five minutes or so when the stream goes live. So Kabuki Kid is the first one in chat tonight. Good to see you, Kabuki Kid. Got uh, Empire of the Sun from GMT Games tonight. So looking forward to that. Uh, I could have swore back in the day that I had done an unboxing and a review for Empire of the Sun, but uh, I have not. <laughs> so, whoops. I don't know. That's kind of weird. I thought I had. But I guess I had not. So there is some uh, gaming news tonight, amazingly enough. So did run across some stuff that I found interesting, at least. And hopefully you will, too. I know there are some folks out there who are not fans of the tabletop gaming news of the day. So if you are one of those folks, by all means, take a look in the show notes below. And you can skip ahead. So... That said, let's jump on into the news because this summer we'll see the release of two new Battlestar Galactica Starship Battleship classes. And I've got the dope. Although I should mention before we get into that, that tonight's show is actually sponsored by Flying Pig Games and Tiny Battle Publishing. So my uh, buddy Mark H. Walker's two companies of which he happens to be the uh, Grand Poobah himself of, are actually sponsors of our War Game Wednesdays. So, I was messing around with all this stuff today. So, uh, for some strange reason, hey, Dan from No Enemies Here is second up in chat. Good to see you, Dan. Uh, I was going to say that um, I was messing around with some of the stuff today. Some of the, uh, like the overlays and and, you know other things in the software that I use. So uh, some of the news slides should be like a little bit bigger, but it was kind of irritating me because when I would watch the video on say YouTube afterwards, just make sure everything's okay. Some of the news slides would have like a dark line, like, like they weren't big enough to cover the screen and then others wouldn't. And I was like, what in the world's going on? So I have actually, arranged it so there's kind of an overlay so i'm testing this out to see what's going on i'm wondering if it's uh if it's the actual image just because it's really bizarre trying to make sure that that image is fit exactly so that when i move from one news piece to another news piece 
the website address doesn't like bounce up and down. It's all pretty, pretty straight, pretty level. So I don't know. We'll find out. So if I end up watching the video and checking out the news segment and finding out that there's still black lines on either side for some and not for others, I'll know it's like, yeah, nothing I can do about it. Anyway, as I started to say, this summer we'll see the release of two new Battlestar Galactica Starship Battleship classes, and I've got the dope. The second wave of Spaceship Packs for Battlestar Galactica Starship Battles from Ares Games, the combat miniature game based on the Battlestar Galactica TV series, is due to release this summer, including the Colonial Raptor and Cylon Heavy Raider. Each of them will be featured in three different versions, and the game sections is updated with information and images of these upcoming expansions. Got to point out, there are actually three images of each one of these ship classes, but there's almost no difference whatsoever. There's just tiny little paint scheme differences. Hey, Viper Dave's popping in. Good to see you, Viper Dave. So the Raptor is designed to play multiple roles, ranging from reconnaissance and scouting to supporting missions with electronic countermeasures and deploying additional firepower. It is slower and less maneuverable than a Viper, but it is capable of short range, faster than light jumps, and can be armed to fight back Cylons. The three versions coming are the generic SAR slash ECM, the Assault slash Combat, and Sharon Boomer Valerie's Raptor. The Heavy Raider is a Cylon multifunctional spacecraft used to attack colonial ships and transport Cylon fighters on boarding missions. Like a Cylon Raider, the spacecraft is sentient and self-flying. It can also be piloted by Centurions or human form Cylons, but its lack of windows forces the pilot to rely on electronics only to navigate. It's featured in three versions, Generic Combat Transport, Veteran, and Captured. These spaceship packs allow players to add more spaceships to the game, obviously enough. Each pack includes a ready-to-play model, painted and assembled, spaceship card, gaming base, maneuver deck, and a set of pilot cards. There's no word yet on the MSRPs, but it does appear that each of the three configurations of each class will be available this summer. So, ah, so Viper Dave says, just got Empire of the Sun today. Sweet, yes, the third printing from GMT Games. So I really enjoyed the starter set for Battlestar Galactica Starship Battles. Uh, and I thought for the price, I thought you got a pretty good deal because you got two, two Cylon Raiders, you got a couple of Vipers, you got, uh, you know, cards and, you know, turning radius stuff and things like that. But when I did my review, I was curious what they were going to do with further ships because Battlestar Galactica did not have a ton of various different, you know, like starfighter classes. So it seems we're going to be seeing like a trio of ship, a trio of different variants for the ship classes when they come out. I don't know. I gotta, I gotta be honest. I'm not too keen on that. Do we really need three different heavy Cylon Raiders. One's a captured one, so it's a little, it's got a little paint scheme on it and stuff. I don't know. I have no idea. So, but uh, I am glad to see there are new minis coming because uh, for a while I was kind of wondering, are, are Ares games going to, you know, support this? So, anyway, so it's War Game Wednesday. I don't have any, like, real wargaming news per se, but I do want to point out Arcane Wonders has a battle card game that's arriving next month, and I've got the dope on Air, Land, and Sea. In Air, Land, and Sea, two players participate in a series of battles with the objective to control two of the three theaters of war after both players have played all of their battle cards or convince your opponent to withdraw. As supreme commander of your country's military forces, you must carefully deploy your forces across three possible theaters of war. Air, land, and you guessed it, sea. 
The order you play your battle cards is critical, and so is how you play them. All cards can either be played face up or face down. Playing a card face up triggers its tactical ability, but the card must be played in its corresponding theater. Face down cards are wild and can be played in any theater, but they only have a strength of two and do not grant tactical abilities. At the start of each battle, you'll be dealt a hand of six cards. You will not draw additional cards during the battle, so you must formulate your strategy based on only these cards. Players take turns playing battle cards one at a time until either all cards have been played or one player decides to withdraw. You don't have to continue a battle to the very end. Sometimes it might be best to withdraw in order to deny your opponent complete victory. In air, land, and sea, a strategic withdrawal may lose you the battle to ultimately win the war. Victory points are awarded to the end, at the end, I should say, of each battle based on the results and the first player to 12 victory points wins the game. Air, Land, and Sea is for two players, ages 14 and up, plays around 15 to 30 minutes, and will carry an MSRP of $14.99 when it arrives on May 15th. Interesting, maybe. So, uh, yeah, just, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, yeah, it's a $15 card game. Might be okay. Speaking of card games, and of course this has kind of, this seems to have like a, a World War II theme to it. There's a, uh, a f free to play collectible card game that's, uh, I think it's in early access right now. And I want to say it's called Cards with a K. So K-A-R-D-S. And uh, I've heard some good things about it. And, and it's, uh, I guess the cards, the, the artwork is all propaganda posters and things like that. So you might, uh, those of you out there who, who enjoy sort of like uh, collectible card games, trading card games, whatever you want to consider it, the, uh, the early access is going on for cards. So uh, I was thinking of taking a peek. Although I have to admit, to me it seems a little strange because you, I guess there's five different factions so you've got us britain soviet union germany and japan and you can mix and match their forces together so to me that sounds kind of odd but uh i don't know like i said i've heard some yeah, pretty decent things about it speaking of card games and war a card game of warring critters is on the horizon from plaid hat games and I've got the Dopon Battlelands Aftermath Edition. Messiah twitched his mousy snout and took aim with his ballpoint pen sniper rifle. He held his breath and crack! The rat went down and that seemed enough encouragement to cause the other junkers to rout. And actually they spelled rout incorrectly. It's R-O-U-T, not R-O-U-T-E. That's like roots. Duh. But there was little time to celebrate as a gecko hunter emerged from the nearby underbrush and made a beeline for Messiah. The scaled ones were joining the fray. Plat Hat Games is pleased to announce Battlelands, a fast and furious card game of turf warfare. Send your fighters to seize key locations or recruit even fiercer warriors who can help you turn the tide. Use your faction's abilities to play dirty and keep your opponents guessing your next move. Battlelands is set in the world of Aftermath, an upcoming adventure book game from Mice and Mystics creator Jerry Hawthorne. Battlelands offers a first glimpse into a fascinating world in which human beings have vanished and the remaining critters now clash over their inheritance. Play as the ruthless rat junkers or the sneaky scaled ones. Lead the malformed Blighted sewer dwellers. Wouldn't they be blighted? Uh, the brave coalition of hoodies or the nocturne scavengers. The resources left behind by the humans are precious and dwindling, and only one faction can secure enough for victory. Will your people survive the coming conflict, or will they be swept aside by more ruthless opponents like me? Battlelands is available for pre-order right now and will be in retail stores everywhere 
in July of 2019. Battlelands is for three to five players, ages 14 and up, plays in around 30 to 60 minutes, and can be pre-ordered for an MSRP of $14.95. That is very fair. That's a, I think that's a pretty good price. Plus, I gotta admit, the artwork's pretty cool on this game. So, uh, so yeah, so maybe you could play a little uh, Bruce Springsteen while you're playing that, right? Battlelands! Oh, I'm sorry, this Badlands. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, th this does seem kind of cool. And it's kind of interesting because it's set in an upcoming game world that's not out yet. So I think this card game's coming out before the adventure book game comes out. If I remember right, I think... Isn't it uh, Stuffed Fables? Isn't that an adventure book game? It's from Plaid Hat. I gotta be honest, I don't think I've ever played a Plaid Hat game. I just, uh, you know, once they got bought up by Asmodee, it's it's pretty tough. Every, all those companies that are under that Asmodee umbrella, uh, you know, the Borg. No, actually, that's Hasbro. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's just very, very difficult to, to kind of get in for review copies of stuff from some of these companies. In fact, all of the companies. Fantasy Flight Games was always tough in the first place. Now it's now it's practically impossible. All right, so my final news piece. I love RPGs, so let's share a little role-playing game news because the third installment of the Tyrant's Grasp Pathfinder Adventure Path, that is just a big mouthful there, is available today, and I've got the dope on Last Watch. Disaster looms over Vigil. The heroes race to the Crusaders in Vigil to warn them of the Whispering Tyrant's devastating new weapon. Amid a citywide celebration, Vigil's leaders are disinclined to believe in credible tales from the frontier, so the heroes must uncover the conspirators who seek to engineer the city's destruction. At the center of these schemes is a gang of thieves whose Long ago, Heist has finally brought old enemies to light. Will the heroes assemble the clues in time to warn others of the doom that hangs over Vigil? This volume of Pathfinder Adventure Path continues the tyrant's grasp, Adventure Path, and includes... That sentence just doesn't sound right, does it? This volume of Pathfinder Adventure Path continues the tyrant's grasp, Adventure Path. How many times do you want to say Adventure Path? It includes Last Watch, a Pathfinder role-playing game adventure for 8th level characters by Larry Wilhelm. There's an examination of the life-hating threats that dwell in the void of the negative energy plane by Patchen Mortimer. The Secrets of the Sealbreakers, a sect that strives to set the Whispering Tyrant free and break other seals that preserve reality by Greg A. Vaughn. There's also a collection of relics, magic items that grow in power the more they're used in pursuit of a cause from the glorious days of the Shining Crusade by Alexander Agunas. Taking a guess at that. There's also a best series of fearsome monsters, including a bestial humanoid tainted by undeath, an ersatz angel, swarms of noxious dragons, a flying beast from the negative energy plane, a reclusive plant shepherd, and Hordes of Undead by Mike Headley, Isabel Lee, Megan Miracle, Kendra Lee Seedling, I'm sorry, Speedling, <laughs> not Seedling, and Larry Wilhelm. There's actually a small video. There's a short video here from Paizo. I think these are new. I don't remember Paizo doing Adventure Path videos, but it's like a minute and a half. So let's take a peek. We have served our master in secret for ages, from when he stood against pompous knights and vain glorious paladins, to when he was locked away by seals they believed to be eternal. But the whispering tyrant's freedom is at hand. Our allies against the forces of light are many, and they 
are as powerful as they are monstrous. <laughs> he has unlocked a tool to obliterate his enemies. The living shall find nothing but despair and destruction in the tyrant's grasp. Last Watch is available in print, I believe, as of today. I know it's out, but I think today was the day that it became available. It's available in print for $24.99 or in PDF for $17.99. So, there you have it. This uh, Tyrant's Grasp Adventure Path for Pathfinder looks kind of interesting because... It's, uh, it seems to be an adventure path that you're kind of hanging on to, waiting when you have a total party kill. <laughs> so, I, th but the strange thing is, usually the adventure paths all start off with all the characters can be level one. And then after the six releases, everybody's at, I don't know, like level 20, whatever, 15, what have you. Um... So I, I wonder how, if this is basically, because supposedly, and I'm not giving anything away, I'm not spoiling anything, because it's right there on the first adventure's book. Um, all the, the player characters all have been killed, and they're in like this nether world or something like that. So a uh, little bit different, a little, uh, little interesting. So yes, yeah, so, uh, so I had mentioned, yeah, that Stuff Fables looked like it was fun, and uh, Kabuki Kid's like, yeah, it looks good. Never never played it. No, neither have I. So I have no clue. Anyway, so I am going to get into the unboxing for Empire of the Sun, the Pacific War, in just a moment. Do want to point out that if you do follow the Daily Dope, if you visit thegaminggang.com, you already know that it's not a uh, profit for-profit endeavor, either one. So if you like the show, if you like the website, please consider making a small donation to Lil Bub's Big Fund and the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. 100% of all funds that are raised through Lil Bub's Big Fund is granted out to organizations around the United States who care for special needs animals as they await adoption. Yes, they, this is not money that's going to kill shelters or anything like that. So... I love me my pets and I love me my animals, although I am not uh, a member of PETA by any stretch of the imagination because they're kooks. But <laughs> but uh, if you if you like the show, if you like the website, by all means, please consider tossing a few bucks towards a little bub's big fund. If you do, by all means, shoot me an email and uh, I will actually give you a shout out on the following show. You don't have to prove that you made a donation, just... Tell me that you did. And I do appreciate the folks out there who do send me emails saying, hey, I made a donation, but I don't want you <laughs> to, to mention me on the show. It's not why I did it. So thank you. I appreciate that as well. So what's coming up the rest of this week and into next? So my mom did get into town today. So she uh, made it in. Uh, I am not going over to my brother's to go visit tonight, but I will be tomorrow. So what I'm going to be doing is I am actually going to pre-record at least tomorrow's show. So I will release that. Uh, I will upload it uh, probably in the afternoon. And on that show, I am reviewing the Starfinder Beginner Box from Paizo Inc., this, uh, I got to admit, this is just jam-packed. This is jam-packed with goodies, folks. So, uh, I got to, I have to admit, uh, I never got a chance to take a look at the Pathfinder beginner box, which, of course, we'll have a new one probably in about a year-ish. Uh, that would be my guess, about a year, because we've got the new edition of Pathfinder coming out. And it's usually around a year or so after a, the new edition comes out that they do a, a beginner box because Starfinder's been out for a year almost a year so and this is not available yet this is still on pre-order so I am going to review this on tomorrow's show 
Yes, Kabuki Kid says yes. PETA are a bit extreme. A bit? Yeah. And they kill animals. So it's like, uh, I don't know what your deal is. It's like, don't try to come across high and mighty because they killed plenty of animals in their shelters. So on Friday's show, I am reviewing Forum Trajanum from Stronghold Games. It'll be on Friday's show. This might be another that I pre-record. All depends on what's going on. So, but um, I will, if you follow me on Twitter at the gaming gang and you'll know what's cooking. I will, I will give people the heads up on if it's a live show or not. So that's on Friday show, Monday show. I'm going to be reviewing wild lands, the miniatures game designed by Martin Wallace from Osprey games. Not only have the core box here, but I've also got a couple of uh, sets of uh, additional miniatures. So uh, we took a peek at those. I will be reviewing the core game and give you my thoughts on the uh, the expanded uh, miniature sets. One has six, the other has four, which off the bat, I, I thought that was kind of strange because I think they're the same price. Then on Tuesday show, I'm reviewing Tiny Towns from Alderac Entertainment Group, or as I like to say, AEG. So that is on Tuesday show. Week from today, War Game Wednesday, we are going to unbox and take a first look at Time of Crisis, the Roman Empire in turmoil. It's in turmoil from GMT Games, as well as the expansion, the special expansion that came out, the Age of Iron and Rust. So we will be unboxing and taking a look at both of those. And then, of course, I had mentioned yesterday I had received the Dungeons and Dragons starter set, the the Stranger Things starter set, which I was not expecting because they didn't have me on the list because it was a Hasbro release, not a Wizards of the Coast release. Uh, this is like super light. This I found out I thought I had an MSRP of twenty dollars. It has an MSRP of twenty five dollars. And it is a featured buy today on Amazon, today only. And it's going for $17.99 on Amazon. So I'm kind of curious. Like I said, this is super light. So we will be taking a look at that. I am going to actually shoot a standalone video for that because I don't want to devote, like, you know, a segment of the show and it's like 10 minutes of looking through it and we're done. So that is what's coming up on next week's shows, as well as what's coming up the rest of this week. So I know folks are tuning in to check out Empire of the Sun, the Pacific War, 1941 to 1945. It's from GMT Games. It is designed by Mark Herman. Game is for two players. There are solitaire rules as well. It's for ages 12 and up. I don't know about that one. I'll have to take a look at the box because sometimes sell sheet info is not correct. But uh, sell sheet says 12 and up plays in around two hours or more. And I will definitely tell you a bit more uh, depending on the scenario. And it does carry an MSRP of $75. This is the third printing. So Kabuki Kid says, ah, that looked fun. Love the retro box. Talking about the D&D &D starter set, obviously with the uh, the tie into Stranger Things. So let's move on over to the other camera because we've got Empire of the Sun, Pacific War right here. So this, uh, this game has been out. Now this has second edition and second printing, but this just showed up and the website for GMT is saying that it's a third printing. I believe this is the third printing here, folks. So, uh, but it is the second edition. So the first thing, I know a lot of people out there are curious, hey, so how deep is the box? Yes, it is in the big deep box. So, because now I didn't remember this, but supposedly Empire of the Sun previous uh, edition came in a much shorter box, came in the, in the shorter GMT box. So I am not positive. So, uh, Mix and match, says Dan over at No Enemies Here. 
I'm not sure what we're mixing and matching. So let's get this shrink off of this here. I am not going to read all of the flavor text on the back. So yeah, see, so right here it says 14 and up. That's what I would expect. And I would expect this to be ages 14 and up because of the complexity, not necessarily because of the small counters that kids can swallow and things like that. So it does show it's for one to two players. And uh, each turn equals four months. Now, there are various different scenarios in this. Uh, different years, effectively, is basically how that's going to work. But uh, you can string them together as an entire campaign if you want. This is a card-driven game as well. I'm trying to remember when this originally came out. Uh, because this, this is an older design. Now, I'm not saying this is like, you know, 1970s SPI. But uh, I'm talking that uh, this, is, uh, this is an older Mark Herman design. Uh, sounds like a revisit of Mice and Mystics. As far as that uh, Battlelands game could be, I don't know. I, I actually never played Mice and Mystics. so. But uh, I had to admit that uh, that little card game looked kind of interesting. And it's another $15 game. So, so we've got the rule book. We've got card driven solitaire system. We got uh looks like we've got some player aids here. Looks like we've got a uh a map as well that I'm not sure what you're gonna be planning on this. Maybe you're planning um amphibious assault, something like that. Okay, so let's take a look into the rule book. So we got the intro introduction, talking about the causes of the war, talking about components, sample ground units, sample carrier unit, air units, HQ unit, naval unit, and control markers. So we've got the Japanese, the US, the British, and Russians. So we're showing uh, the US land and air blue, army is green, Japanese Navy is uh, white background with red, Army has a yellow background, yellow-ish background. British have tan. Australian, yeah, they're going to be tan too. Indian tan. Dutch, they got some Chinese units as well. So this is not a low-complexity game by any stretch of the imagination whatsoever. So we've got setting up the game, talking about general course of play, sequence of play. As you can see, as I mentioned, this is kind of a an older design. And what I'm saying, when I say older design, I mean it's probably about maybe 10 years old, 12 years old. If we look at the rule book, and this says 19, or not 19, it says 2018, duh, edition here. This does have the look of older GMT rule books. Normally, with the newer releases from GMT, and this, like I said, this is this is a 2018 printing, according to the box, and according to right here, copyright at the bottom of this book. But you can see, not as not as uh, image heavy as some of the rule books that we've seen recently from GMT. Now, I'm not saying that this is just complete. You know, all just wall of text and everything's case point like an old Avalon Hill game. No, we've got some images here, but uh, we tend to see a lot more uh, examples of play and things like that from newer releases from GMT. So we're talking about battles, battle resolution, air naval combat procedure. The turn determining the winner of the air naval combat. Reinforcements and amphibious shipping points. We've got replacements. Strategic warfare, national status, national surrender. The du they were showing the Dutch in Indies as far as their surrender there. 
Got India, China. Inter-service rivalry. That's interesting. Yeah, that's very interesting. Then we've got the scenario. So we've got the full campaign, December 41 to August 45. So that is the first scenario there. So that's pretty. you're pretty much looking at everything. It's got a 1942. Looks like we've got... Uh, well, that's 19... Oh, here we go. 1943 down here. Nineteen forty-four. I don't. Is there a forty-five scenario? I wouldn't think so. Uh, shortened campaign, even shorter campaign, South Pacific. And then we get master scenario setup list. Depending on what year. No, there's no forty-five. So we've got the U.S. Commonwealth, Chinese, Dutch. Then we've got the Japanese. Then we get a comprehensive example of play, which I always dig. I'm I'm surprised that there isn't a playbook. Uh, so Dan is asking if I am a Pathfinder RPG fan. I will be the first to point out that I have only actually ever looked at one Pathfinder role-playing game release. And it was their uh, occult book or something like that. Uh, actually, their their PR person, their new PR person, uh, is uh, on board. So uh, I got to be honest. Uh, I look at a lot of different role playing games. I have really not dug into Pathfinder in the past, but with the new second edition, they've got me like in line for. For I think there's 10 titles that are coming out like when it releases. So uh, so I don't know. I'll find out if I'm a Pathfinder RPG fan. I don't have a dog in the fight, really, uh, as far as fantasy RPGs. I, I basically look at it, play what you like. If you like 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, play it. If you like Pathfinder, which is like D&D 3.75, play that. If you like old school renaissance where it's, you know, more about uh, the skill of the players as opposed to the attributes and skills of the character, you know, player characters, uh, then play that. If you're a Call of Cthulhu fan like I am, run that. So, but uh, yeah, I don't have a dog in the fight. I don't have any great hatred for, for any role-playing game systems either. So that is the rule book. Then we've got the card-driven solitaire system here. Let's see what we got here. So the introduction, talking about key concepts, talking about task force compositions, axis of determination, random choices, sequence of play with Erasmus, Japanese priorities, allied priorities, talking about card selections. See, when games start getting into these different flow charts and, and things like that, and that's when it's like uh, start getting, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just, it's just my eyes start to glaze over a little bit. Uh, I used to play some really, really, really in depth war games back in the day. It's just, I don't, I like playing a game for hours at a time. I am not necessarily one of these people that's like, oh, this game's got to be over in 45 minutes, man. I don't want to play this game anymore. It's not like uh, I lose interest after like 60 minutes with a game. But, uh, and I have no issue playing something for like six, seven hours, <laughs> devoting a weekend to it. It's just, uh, I don't know. Some of, some, of the, uh, some of the really heavy war games, I just... I don't know. I, I just start, my eyes glaze over and I start to check out. So I'm not necessarily saying Empire of the Sun is like that, uh, especially because we're just looking at the solitaire aspect of the game. Uh, but that's that's what I'm talking about. Um, even like the coin series stuff. The coin series has, you know, a lot of the, the, uh, the flow charts and things like that for the various different factions. If you're playing the bot, 
right? So if you're playing um, solitaire or if like, say for an example, you're playing a three player game and you got the four factions. Um, I mean, those are okay, but I personally would not sit there and play uh, just solitaire with three bots. It's just, to me, it's not, it's, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, uh, I know a lot of people out there are going to say, Jeff, you're, you're crazy, man. You should just play all that solitaire bot stuff. And I'm like, mm. it just doesn't, to me, it just doesn't replace a real person. So we've got this, uh, got this terrain map here. Oh, this is the South Pacific map. So, uh, I want to say, I think this is for a shorter scenario. Because it says breaking the Bismarck barrier 42 to 43. So I think that's what this is for. And that's why we've got the terrain effects chart up here. Naval combat results, ground combat results. So uh, this is the ba battling uh, around the Solomons. There you go. New Guinea. There's Australia. The New Hebrides. Okay, so we got combat tables. So we got a couple of player handouts here. Player aid charts. Ground combat results. So we've got terrain effects, air naval combat results, Allied HQ, command chart. There's the inner service rivalry. All U.S. Army Air Corps, not Allied or U.S. Marine slash Navy reinforcements are automatically delayed. Hmm. There's actually Japanese inner service rivalry as well. Then we've got uh, Battle Factor Calculator. So you add up your combat factors here. Then the combat effectiveness. So we've got that. All right, so reinforcement schedules for the allies at the start. Obviously, <laughs> these are going to be single-sided because you're going to put the counters on these we've got the japanese gotta admit this is jam-packed this box there there's nothing i mean we took the rule book out we got the little map out we've got some of the play aids i mean and this is you see there's like really no uh no air no empty air here so we've got the player aid card here so looks like there's one, one of these. So we're talking about reinforcements, replacements, supply lines, aircraft zone of influence, U.S. political will, national surrender. That's interesting. U.S. political will. That's kind of cool. Uh, here's the bot. The axis of determination. So this is for the allies. See, this is what I'm talking about. When I start looking at things like this, this is where I start to say, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if I, I want to be playing this solitaire. So, but that's just me. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who just absolutely love this stuff. Plus, you got to give Mark Herman and GMT credit because this is included in the game. So, it gives you the ability to actually play solitaire with uh with what looks to me to be a pretty uh pretty robust ai so here's card selection task force composition reaction play by mail that's usually what pbm means play by mail that's pretty wild so opening phase over here we've got uh mid game phase end game phase so lots of info there we've got uh, some counter sheets not as many as you would expect so that is one of the interesting aspects I find of uh, some of the card driven war games from uh, GMT is uh, you would think you're going to have a bunch of counter sheets but you really don't alright Dan is uh, popping on out of here alright Dan Thanks for uh, stopping by, checking out the show again tonight. And uh, all the best on Saturday's New Enemies here. So we've got a couple of counter sheets here. So uh, we've got Army units, Air units, Naval units. We've got 
got control markers here. I should say uh, these are the naval units, it looks like. So we've got the Japanese. We've got the British and Commonwealth units. We got the US. Don't see any uh, Russian <laughs> Russian naval units because I don't think there really were any in the Pacific War. Okay, so we've got those two counter sheets. Then we've got good old map. Which I'm going to look at that last. Or you know what? I will actually look at that right now because... Then I can zoom in and we'll look at the cards. So I'm going to get uh, the box and stuff, some of this stuff out of the way. I'm sure this is uh, going to take up quite a bit of space. So let's see. So as I've mentioned before, when I take my... Uh... So Kabuki Kid says, I'd love to get my hands on the new Solitaire box. Uh, yeah, I wonder, I wonder if, because a lot of times GMT will actually sell uh, just standalone expansions for uh, people who've already purchased a previous edition, if the game hasn't completely changed radically. So I wonder if that's available from... Um, GMT. I have no idea. So this board is a pretty good size board here. So I could probably zoom all the way out to give you a kind of an idea of the size of the board. Although I know my my mug is blocking off some of the some of the board here. So we've got uh, a lot of empty open ocean. Although we do see that we have the various different islands here uh, with air bases. They're marked as air bases. We can kind of, let's zoom in and take a look at kind of the layout of the map a bit. So we've got the Philippines here. We've got New Guinea. There's Australia over along here. Let's fold these in, pull this out a little bit. We've got Borneo. Java, Sumatra, Malaya, Siam. Now we're back into China. We got Burma. One of the I know when I see Borneo, I always think of that uh, that movie with Nick Nolte. That uh, I really, really, it, you know, I think it was kind of a flop, but um, I thought it was excellent. And I'm trying to remember. It's not fair. Is it Farewell to the King? I think it might be called Farewell to the King. And it, Nick Nolte's basically, uh, uh, I want to say he he's a Marine whose transport ship is torpedoed or whatever, and he's one of the only guys who sur ends up surviving, uh, making his way to, uh, I want to say it's the it's Borneo. <laughs> so, and then he leads, uh, he eventually leads this, guerrilla war against the Japanese and that it's actually a really good movie. Although, uh, I think a lot of people just, you know, didn't bother checking it out. So pretty cool board here. Yes. And it is a large board. It's eightfold. So that is the map. Uh, no, there is no tray. I know. When did we ever see a, a, a counter tray from GMT. That's what I'm kind of curious about. Uh, I can't think of a, a game, a single game that's got from GMT that's got a uh, counter tray. Maybe, I, you know, it's not as if I've seen every single game that ever came out from <laughs> GMT, but I always just kind of check underneath the little folds just in case. But, nope nothing there of course that's usually where you take your baggies of counters and put them under you know they go under here all right so we got a couple of 10-sided dice so we've got those so let's take a look to see what we've got so we've got the japanese deck and we've got the allied deck so let me grab my 
handy dandy hobby knife. Oh, this one's actually split already a little bit. There we go. So we got the allies. So we got the allied deck here. Let's get this Japanese deck opened up. If, uh, if you were watching the show the other night, and I was talking about um, the Solitaire game that was from Victory Point Games, Steve Carey had designed it. And I said, it's Scorpion something. And I said, it's like, uh, it's about the siege of Malta during World War II. And of course, unfortunately, it's no longer being published by Victory Point Games. Uh, the name of it was That Scorpion of the Sea. That was what it was. Because uh, I have it. <laughs> I actually have it. So, uh, you know, I, I have not talked to Steve Carey in a long, long time. I know he, health-wise, he was kind of uh, not doing so hot. So, uh, but he had, he had actually done those two designs for Victory Point Games. It did really, really well. And they he got into it with, uh, with Ellen Emmerich, and that was it. That was the end of things. Okay, so we're gonna we're not gonna look at every single card here, but uh, so normally what we've got is you have the option of taking the event or using operation points. Now, I don't think this is necessarily gonna be how this works. So, uh, Kamikaze Attacks is draw one strategy card. We've got a lot of text here. Pretty small image. Pretty small historical image. So, I see we've got OC4 EC Dash. Says it's a reaction and 81. Now, I'm going to take a guess. That's card 81. Yeah, it is because that's 82. So, Indian Worker Strike. Invasion of Java. Jan 25 code change. Submarine attack. Oh, I-58 sinks the USS Indianapolis. Ouch. Uh, so that is actually one of the one of the latest uh, events time-wise. So that is uh, I'm trying to see, depending on the scenario. You're gonna have different decks, but I'm not seeing anything that tells you the date. So maybe, I'm taking a guess, maybe it's the color up here? Possible. Operation Z attack on Pearl Harbor. No, because we gotta, well, I guess, yeah, I guess that happened quite a bit. Uh, code, code change from the Japanese Navy again. Do a little raid reprisal. So these are all the Japanese cards. So, so we'll see like OC here. We have like OC5 EC7. Says it's a military card. This is political. Reaction. So it looks as if we've got military and political cards. And reaction cards. Uh, looks like there's a lot of worker strikes in India to mess with uh, the allies. Chiang Kai-shek, big Tokyo Express operation, combined fleet battle of Santa Cruz. U.S. Army Navy dispute slows U.S. reinforcements. So, uh, so about 83 cards I think I saw. I think that's what I spotted. 83 cards in the Japanese deck here. 86, my apologies. So we got 86. Uh, hey, look, Mark Herman has actually popped on in. <laughs> so uh, the decks are not time segregated. So OC equals Intel die roll, if used for that value. EC, if used for the event. Oh, post-battle movement. Okay, so I know. So just shows being old school where PBM <laughs> to me makes me think, Oh, it's for play by mail. <laughs> like play by email these days. All right, so we've got uh, that is the Japanese deck here. Then we got the Allied deck. So taking a peek in at the Allied deck. 
So since we've got Mark in the uh, in the chat here, so the question I would have uh, without actually having to dive into the rule book right now, as far as playing the different scenarios, say starting in like 43 or starting in 42, how do you sort out the cards that you're going to utilize for that scenario? I know no one. No, right. I know no one plays by sna snail mail anymore. But uh, I'm just saying, when I see PBM, that's the first thing I think of. Oh, play by mail. Okay, so uh, hopefully we get uh, an answer from Mark, and I will take a peek at the allies deck here. So we got the Batan Death March, Operation Matador, the Doolittle Raid. There we go. And there we go, Vinegar Joe Stillwell. <laughs> Uh, Olympic and Coronet, Invasion of Japan, Douglas MacArthur. Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting how uh, a lot of Americans felt MacArthur was a hero, but a lot of the troops who served under MacArthur in World War II were uh, not necessarily fans. Uh, all right, so Operation Watchtower, War in Europe. Like I said, we're not going to take a look at all of these, but if you if you notice, there's compared to other deck uh, card driven games, I almost said deck building games, uh, other card driven games. So say for an example, Twilight Struggle or 1960 or something along those lines. Uh, even honestly, if I think about it, even Washington's War, there's a lot more text, a lot more going on on these cards than, well, especially like Twilight Struggle or uh, 1960. But for some strange reason, I even think, I don't remember too many cards in Washington's War having like that much text on them. But then again, it's been quite a while since I played, so I'm, I might be wrong. All right, so taking a quick peek through here. Operation Cartwheel. PT Boats. Skip bombing attack, Battle of Bismarck Sea. So once again, I'm going to take a, take a stab in the dark. We've got 86 cards for this deck as well. No, we've got 84. All right, so the Japanese deck actually has two more cards. So we've got the Allied deck and the Japanese deck. I guess we can zoom back out a bit. There we go. So we've got that. We've got uh, two 10-sided dice. We've got the handy-dandy GMT baggies. So uh, let's take a look. So there we go. Oh, cool. So uh, Kabuki Kid was interested in the bots, the solo bots that we were looking at. Uh, and they are available on Board Game Geek. Very cool. Yes. Uh, Mark Herman is pointing out this is an expert level war game. Yes, this is not this is not going to be something that you're going to utilize to introduce the hobby to, you know, like, for an example, like my nephew Cameron, uh, even though my nephew Cameron has played quite a lot of games with me and quite a lot of conflict simulations. Uh, this is not one that I would bust out with him. Uh, even Elliot Miller, my best friend over at uh, voiceofv.com. I think this would probably be a little beyond him as well. So, uh, so let me jump back here real quick. Uh, so I was kind of curious about the cards, right? So the rules rule book tells you what cards you're going to have in the, in the deck for the scenarios. It's kind of what I assumed. Uh, I was just kind of curious if there was a, any kind of color coding or something like that. So we've got uh, the big eightfold map. We've got the sheet and a half of counters. We've got a lot of play aids. So these are the bots that uh, Mark Herman's talking about that are available on Board Game Geek that we were taking a peek at previously. So these are the solitaire bot cards. So that's the Japanese. And then we had the allies. Just like so. Got a couple of 
starting reinforcement unit uh, sheets there. We've got a couple of combat table player references. We've got one player aid card, which I thought was kind of strange. We've got the small map for the uh, short South Pacific scenario. We've got the booklet that kind of explains how to use the solitaire system. And then we got the rule book that includes an example of play and the designer notes as well. And that is everything that we got when we take everything outside the box of Empire of the Sun, the Pacific War 1941 to 1945 from GMT Games. So as I pointed out, this is, uh, according to this, this says second edition, second printing, but I could have swore on the GMT website, it was talking about that it was um, the third printing. Although it's still the second edition, it's just a new print run because this sells out really quick. So I am going to point out the game is for two players. We do know it does have the solitaire bots as well. It's for ages 14 and up and plays in two hours or more, depending on the scenario. And the or more could be six to eight hours or possibly more than that does carry an MSRP of $75 as well. So I do want to point out, if you have any interest whatsoever in Empire of the Sun, the Pacific War 1941 to 45, pick it up now. GMT games, their titles tend to sell out rather quickly, especially those that are already in a third printing. So uh, you don't want to get stuck having to either wait a couple of years for another P500 run to get a reprint or a new print run done. And you certainly don't want to have to go to the secondary market and spend extra dough to pick up a game when you could have had it now. So I always point that out with GMT games. So uh, very, very cool to see Mark Herman actually pop in and say howdy to us here. Hey. Mark says, thanks for the unboxing. Actually, Mark, thanks for popping in <laughs> in the chat and saying howdy and answering some questions. Really cool that those bots are available for download on Board Game Geek 2 because there were Kabuki Kid was one of the people asking about that. And I'm sure we'll have other people who watch the video who will be thinking the same thing. How do I get my hands on these bots? I've got this other edition. I'd love to be able to play it solitaire. So sweet. All right, so that is it for today's show. As I mentioned on tomorrow's show, I will be reviewing the beginner box for Starfinder from Paizo Inc. Pre-orders are open for this now. This is not in stores just yet. I think it hits next month, if I remember correctly. I will get the exact date uh, for uh, tomorrow's show so you know when it, it will arrive Anyway, as I like to point out, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to go visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. By now, you know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. I uh, just saw some stuff popping up on, on the uh, chat, making sure that nobody's asking me like a last second question before I sign off. Anyway, so enjoy the rest of your Wednesday night. Had a lot of fun once again on Wargame Wednesday. Big thank you to those out there who were watching live, joined in on chat, uh, and Mark Herman for popping in, answering some questions, because he's the guy who designed this, folks. <laughs> so, and of course, everybody who watches this show after the fact, after the live stream, I definitely appreciate you watching as well. So, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday night. I will see you tomorrow. Thanks again for watching The Daily Dope, presented by The Gaming Gang. If you like this episode, be sure to give it a quick thumbs up. And if you dig the channel, please subscribe. If you'd like to check out our previous episode, click right here. And if you want to check out a somewhat randomly selected episode, give a click right down here. It'll be like opening a box of Cracker Jacks. You just don't know what you'll get. Once again... Thanks for watching, and I'm Jeff McAleer.